um, uh, curate the Oakwood Cemetery Chapel, which is where a number of us are used to getting together to do small talks and events, but we're not scheduling events at, uh, these days. We hope to do so again in the future, but we're not open to the public, but we still are doing all kinds of really great um, online digital exhibits. Our current exhibit is called To Hear, and it's on Austin Musicians, and it's it was really inspiring to learn about. And about a month ago, we did an author talk with Michael Corcoran for his new book, Ghost Notes. Um, and a number of the musicians he wrote about are buried at Oakwood Cemetery. Um, we also have a program called To Write, which is author talks. And this one is one of the few we've done on um, death, dying, grieving, transitions, and change, which are, of course, related to cemetery topics and philosophy. Um, but in, in this case, I feel like we really needed a chance to um, talk about grieving in a poetic way. Um, and I could think of no other example about talking about what I'm grieving right now the most, which is culture and our friends and how much kind of what we do together matters. And I thought that Marianne Winnick's um, writing is a fantastic example of that. And I looked up her, I, I, I follow her on Facebook and I read her in the, um, Baltimore fishbowl. Um, and then I was like, the big book of the dead, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Silly me. So um, I'll give a bit of an introduction. I need to do a little bit of double checking email to make sure people are arriving. So I don't want you to think I'm doing something else or tweeting or Facebooking. <laughs> make sure we're all here. Um, but uh, I came across one of Marion's books, um, Above Us Only Sky, at a common friend's uh, vacation house where I was lucky to be invited. And it was like I was reading the voice of this sister I wished I'd had. I had a sister, it wasn't Marion. <laughs> and, and one of the things that we love in culture is finding uh, this kind of common connection, this like soul connection with someone who you've just met and they've uttered just a few phrases and all of a sudden you know you already know them or that you desire to know them or that there is so much shared value or love or frequency together that you just like leap to connect. And then one of the things that um, Marianne wrote about, which I wrote down because I have so many flags, flags in the book that I realized I would have to spend a whole nother set of hours reflagging them different colors. <laughs> she wrote in the Big Book of the Dead about the Southern writer, though he did not publish until his mid 40s. There were seven books I hadn't read yet. Our relationship was really just the beginning. And that's how I feel about musicians and writers or other artists who I've just discovered and realized there's so much more to know. And whether or not I get to know them in person as a friend um, or even as a faraway acquaintance, um, getting to know their thoughts and their deepest desires and their loves and their griefs and their failures and their laughters is just so reassuring and makes me feel not alone. So when I read Above Us Only Sky, I met someone who like profoundly made me feel not alone. And so I was so excited um, to reach out, discover we had a whole bunch of friends in common on Facebook and to reach out to Marion and become her big fangirl. So uh, I'll give her a proper introduction, which this is not the first book she's written and the big book of the dead, which we'll talk about some more came from a few other volumes which are confusingly titled a little bit because they're writ they're titled, for example, the Baltimore Book of the Dead. And it's not just people who died in Baltimore, but she wrote it while she was in Baltimore. So you'll find if you read this big book of the dead that a lot of people um, she mentions are from Austin because she spent a great amount of time in Austin. So there's a lot of common ground there for Austin's particular type of culture, which we many of us really enjoy and moved here for. Um, she also wrote uh, her first book, First Comes Love, won a New York Times notable listing, and um, The Big Book of the Dead won the Towson Prize for Literature. She also has another book, which I really enjoyed, called Highs in the Low 50s, and I'm in my low 50s, and it was a really, really nice big hug <laughs> of acceptance, which was great. 
Um, she currently lives in Baltimore. And she you'll see her writings in the New York Times Magazine and The Sun. Uh, she has her own podcast called The Weekly Reader. Um, and you'll find her in a lot of other places. She's a teacher. Um, but primarily, I think what she is is a writer's writer. And the language in which she writes these um, memories of people who affected her uh, it becomes so universal. Like, there are a few people in here who are popular culture people who we might all know or are acquainted with, but you love someone the same way. You just don't always have the right bits of words to put to it. And there are so many phrases in here that have been rattling around my head since I both listened to it on audiobook, hearing your voice, as well as rereading re it in the book, that feel like a dream I already had, which is just shockingly familiar. So I just want to tell you how much I appreciate the amount of detail, clarity, and uh, cultural familiarity that I find in here that makes me feel comforted and not alone and to be human, which these days sometimes I'm really looking hard for a reason to be glad to be human when it, sometimes humanity can be a bit disappointing or scary. So with that long, long chatty fangirl introduction, um, I, for those of you who have just logged on, I um, curate the Oakwood Cemetery Chapel in Austin, Texas. My background's in public art and engagement, and I did my master's thesis on the cemetery because I thought it was a fantastic place to create monuments for love and to talk about the things and the people that mean something to us. With this job, I have some really fantastic colleagues and a wonderful friends group, a number of whom who are here from Save Austin Cemeteries, R.O. Smith being one of those. And so when I was reading this book, I reached out to Aro to ask, I think maybe he might like to co-host this. And it turns out that they have something in common too. So with that, Aro, would you chat a little bit about how you came to know Marion? Sure. Uh, my name's Aro Smith. I'm with Save Austin Cemeteries. I'm also a librarian in town. I've lived in Austin since 1987. Um, and my, a part of my early twenties was, uh, uh, was dealing with uh, the AIDS crisis and HIV and my friends dying. And uh, one of the responses was to build an AIDS hospice. We, we built Christopher House and, and I got to know Marion um, at Christopher House uh, because she was tending to her husband and I was tending to my friends across the hall. And, uh, and she had two small children and I would play in the hall with her small children to distract them. And so I really never, I may have never even talked to Marion during that time because I was just playing with her children so that she could get on with the business of, of, of her husband's illness. And, uh, um, but I feel like I have a, a kinship to her. I feel like our, our grief skills were forged in the same physical place and uh and when these the first two books glen rock book of the dead and baltimore book of the dead came out um i loved love love reading them as well as the the biography of uh, first comes love because it's about our shared experience anyway enough marion please talk Hi. please read please talk <laughs> and ultimately what i want to hear about is is how writing these essays is a, a, a discipline to expiate grief, to deal with grief, to, to live grief. I don't know. Tell us about grieving. Okay. I just wanted to say two little side points that are brought up by uh, what you guys have said. Um, Jennifer, have you ever read uh, On Writing by Stephen King? No, I read it in a different interview about him that references that I'll put it on my list. Um, the I think you would just from what you were talking about, about how writing makes us not be alone. He has the most beautiful riff about what writing is in uh, it's um, so a lot of on writing is like his his writing advice, like never use adverbs and stuff like that. But the introduction is um, it's autobiographical. It's about how he almost died when he was hit by some crazy nut who could have come right out of one of his books. But in it, um, he gives his ideas on writing and what you were saying was really resonating. So read that. And then um, the other thing is something Ara said, like, 
or no, maybe you said it, but um, why these books were, you know, confusingly titled for the, these places, like everyone says, well, is Glenrock Book of the Dead full of people about in Glenrock? Is Baltimore full of people in Baltimore? And this was a problem, really, that the, even the publishers noticed. So um, one of the great things about doing the big book of the dead, aside from getting to bring all the pieces together and put them in the right order and tell the story of my life in a way, was that I got to take the geography out of the title. So <laughs> the, the, in, the confusing geography is no longer a part of the title. So um, the big book of the dead. And um, so it has all the pieces from the Glenrock Book of the Dead and all the pieces from Baltimore and then uh, um, 12 more that I wrote in the year between Baltimore and, and this, which was like the paperback of Baltimore. But what I'm gonna read is the very, very, very first one I ever wrote. And um, it's an Austin person. So here's what happened. Um, this is in 2004 or five. And um, I was at this uh, writing residency that I teach at every year in Pittsburgh. And I went to another writer's workshop to, you know, try to get her tricks and steal them or whatever. And um, um, it was Jane McCafferty, a fiction writer. And she gave this assignment to the class to, uh, she read a poem called Tenderness by Stephen Dunn. That was a poem about his regrets and nostalgia and feelings for a woman that he had had an affair with decades ago. And she asked the class to write about someone that you had that kind of combination of regret and nostalgia and feelings. And I immediately thought of someone, but then I immediately thought of like 40 more people. <laughs> Not that I had had affairs with all of them, but um, that I had this feeling of um, this that mixture of positive and negative and sad and happy and regret and nostalgia. And so I literally wrote down a list immediately on a piece of paper that sort of in some ways became the table of contents of the Glen Rock Book of the Dead. But the one that I wrote like right then and there that was the it directly inspired and became the first one is, um, and I'll say a couple things. So. From the minute I thought of this idea, I knew that they were gonna be really short pieces. I could picture them in my mind, like maybe two paragraphs on a page. It ended up being 400 words was the rule, 400 words or less. And I um, decided not to use people's names because nobody could say whether they wanted to be in this book or not. And, um, and to identify them by their death date, um, rather than any, you know, anything else. And they, anyway, this is the jeweler. He died in 1982. 1977, the days of Eden in the city of Austin, Texas. I was living there the summer before my senior year of college in New England. And though I was double majoring in history and semiotics, I had figured out my true purpose in life, which was to own a frozen yogurt store. Frozen yogurt was new. I was an early and passionate convert. One day while window shopping for a location in the university area, I took a flight of stairs behind the Varsity Theater and found him in his tiny jewelry shop, safety glasses strapped to his head, making comets of amethyst and silver. He was about 25, which was old to me, and he looked like a Bavarian elf, pink cheeks, smooth skin, goatee and thin ponytail. I explained about my frozen yogurt store. Have you ever had vanilla ice cream with fresh mangoes, he asked. He made it for me after an Indian dinner in his apartment. The first time I had a poppadum, the first time I visited someone whose canvases were stacked against their unfinished walls. A burning draft card, purple comets and oil crayon galaxies. Oh, I said, I love these and he gave me three or four. How much he liked me made me nervous. We didn't stay in touch, and he died before I moved back to Austin in 1983. He went through a crazy time, I heard, 
cocaine and strippers at the Yellow Rose, and just when people had almost given up on him, he met a wonderful girl. She spoke six languages. Her whole family loved him. Their wedding was practically an affair of state with limousines full of flowers and diplomats strung down the road. Lady Bird Johnson, even. A month later, he slipped out of their bed for a few hours to visit his old friends. When his new wife woke up in the morning, he was dead beside her. The wedding gifts were still in their boxes and the blue bonnets in bloom when all the fancy people had to come back for the funeral. Today, frozen yogurt is everywhere, but I have lost my taste for it. And I also long ago lost one of the Colombian emerald earrings he made for my 21st birthday. My mother bought the stones and he set them in little cylinders of gold. The other I'm wearing right now. So I don't know if anyone listening knows, but that was a guy named Heinz Schultz. And um, yeah, when 25 was old to me, I think I was about 17 when I met him. So he was the beginning of the whole thing. And um, now he is in the section of the book that is all the people from Austin and it's a big section. And um, I'll read another one that kind of starts from the early days. It's actually the one that follows him immediately in the book. The Carpenter, died 1993. That same summer, at a swimming hole in Austin where we were playing backgammon and eating bagels, a couple of cute boys from our home state came up to introduce themselves. One of them, an immigrant Italian barber's son, would become my brother, not only because he married my sister seven years later. He was our Dean Moriarty, irresistible, legendary, bossy, and full of ideas. He could build anything, fix anything, and he could talk to dogs. He was the first white person I knew to appreciate hip hop. He had a union card. He talked like Robert De Niro in Raging Bull. He had scholarships to art schools in Kansas City and New York, and he loved Keith Haring and John michel Basquiat. In Texas, he spray painted the name of my first book on a railroad bridge, and when we moved to New York, zoomed around at night printing the shapes of t-shirts on the walls. Oops. He and my sister hopped yachts in Florida, sent postcards from his relative's town in Italy, shipped home little packets of heroin from Thailand. He was not afraid of needles. Next to one another, our lives were an object lesson in the class structure of the late 20th century East Coast suburb, the Italians versus the Jews. For example, the vast difference in the amount of money and attention devoted to our flat feet, lazy eyes, and crooked teeth, our little talents, and our educations. He mocked me for how carefully I divided the phone bill in our communal apartment, which, I had to point out, was furnished entirely through his trash picking. We used to laugh ourselves sick with our version of Sonny and Cher's theme song. Well, I don't know if all that's true, but you got me, and baby, I got you. Babe. <laughs> Fuck you, babe. <laughs> Do you remember when it seemed impossible that people as young and strong as this would lie with their heads shaved and their bones sticking out wearing diapers in St. Vincent's Hospital? The year he died, 1993, was near the peak of the dying, and by the end of the century, about a half million American boys and a few girls would die of AIDS. 25 million worldwide now. It was his time. He is at peace. He is free from pain at last. Who wants to hear these things? I'd rather take the whole last few years of his life, the addiction, the sickness, the breakup, crumble them up and hide them like a paper full of mistakes you don't want anyone to see. I miss him more, not less, as time goes by. That's one of my favorites as well. Oh. That's my brother-in-law, Steve Serbo. And that, that makes it seem like I should read The Skater. Um, I want you to read The Skater. I also want you to read The Clown, though, because in The Clown, oh, the you, clown. You, you, talk about, you talk about the writing. And, uh, and you know what? 
What I would love for people to get out of this is a sense that, uh, that anyone can write a short one page memory and have it be a powerful, beautiful thing. Now you write beautiful, short one page memories, but, but it's a tool that I think we could all use for our grief. Yes. Um, I, I think so, and I kind of have heard now that it has been, you know, that um, a lot of um, creative writing teachers and uh, have used this idea as a prompt, and um, it's, the sh it's the shortness of it that makes it work. If you, you know that you only have 400 words, you can't write more, you know, well, you may write more than that in your first draft, but the the fact that it has to be so short makes it possible i think because otherwise you think well i could write a you know 10 volume encyclopedia about my relationship with this person you know it's impossible and then you have to write um 400 words that the one that i think is the most about that in a way is that it's one do you know the one the boy with the wrong story it's the one where i i, I end up talking to his mom and i'm showing draft. Well, so one important thing about the book is that with almost every one of them, I was dealing with people that knew the person and sending back and forth and really trying to make sure that even though I didn't use the name, that the, any surviving friends and family of the person would be happy that the thing was in the book and not otherwise. So um, most of the time, when I would contact people and explain what I was doing and say I was going to write about, you know, hope to write about their person, would they talk to me? No one said no. No one said, I don't want you to do this. Everyone wanted to talk about their person. But the one that was the biggest challenge was that boy with the wrong story. And it's um, because I tried to, it was too soon. You know, um, it had only been like a month when, you know, and um, it just for her, it was, you know, I might, it might have made a mistake in trying to do that one, but he's in here anyway. Um, so, yeah, it was a really one of the best things about doing the book was all the re research of talking to people and, um, you know, recovering much more than I knew about the people in their lives, usually. Uh. Um, well, should we hear the skater? Yes, please. The skater died 1994. 1983 started out looking a lot like 1982, but was transformed entirely by a gay bartender I met at Mardi Gras, where my friends had taken me for a rest cure. He was a beautiful young man, and beautiful things formed effortlessly in his wake. Double axles, rose bushes, pale yellow-green cocktails made from perno. When I saw him tending bar in the French Quarter, I fell in love immediately as did everyone. Improbable as it seemed and seems, he loved me back. And so began his remarkable transformation from tank-topped disco thing to ponytailed stay-at-home dad. It helped that he was a person who felt no need to make sense of things, that despite his cool affect, he was driven purely by emotion. Skater, hairdresser, gardener, lover of wall treatments, virgin of Guadalupe icons and synth pop compilations on cassette tape. Yet when you saw him with his little sons, who slept in their baby seats on the floor of the hair salon, there was no doubt as to his true calling. By the time we got married, we knew he was positive and I wasn't. His old friends were already dying. I wholeheartedly believed we would be spared, but perhaps he did not. There were six good years and two nightmarish ones, during which we took a fair shot at outdoing the virus at wrecking our own lives. Then there was the day he checked out of the hospice and came home to die. He had lived too long in the valley of the shadow, where time bloats up as if having an allergic reaction to your presence, where a week has a million days. It made me sick when just four months after he gave up, better drugs were announced. But I don't know if he would have waited, even if he knew. Our brother-in-law, the carpenter, had 
sent him postcards from a road he never wanted to see. Many years later, when they were almost men, I gave his boys the tape he made them before he died, a tape I had listened to once and slipped into a drawer. They sat side by side on the bed, unbearably tall and handsome, one with the recorder on his knees, the other pretending to do something on his laptop. What sports do you play? asks their father, his voice high and soft from the morphine drip. He thinks he's talking to little guys who just visited him at the hospice. Are you taking good care of Mama? Do you remember the day at Grandmom's when the boat floated away and Daddy had to jump in and save it so we could get home? Skater. Improbable as it seemed and seemed, he loved me back. Mm. What is a crazy story? <laughs> I see that someone wrote shout out to the Lunchbox Chronicles on the Yellow Dinner. Yes, the Yellow Dinner. You know, I wanted to call that book the Yellow Dinner. Um, I thought that was a much better title than the Lunchbox Chronicles. <laughs> but they said that no one would want to buy a book called the Yellow Dinner. <laughs> um, funny, uh, often you don't really get to name your own books. I always, First Comes Love, I wanted to call Tunnel of Love, but no. And um, I, <laughs> I had some other titles for it too, but they were less, less politically correct. Um, <laughs> While we're still on the skater, I am now guessing you mean roller skating, like rollerblading. No, he was a um, figure oh, skater. Ice skater. Yeah, he was an ice capades. Yeah. <laughs> See, thank you. That's that, like, I I have a husband. I mean, he does roller skate. Too. Um, <laughs> you know, he roller skated, rollerbladed, but um, he was a, you know, he had left high school to train to in, in Lake Placid for the Olympics, but he had terrible uh, competition nerves. So he ended up um, leaving after Eastern Junior Men's Re Regionals or something like that. And he joined I, um, actually Holiday on Ice. And he was um, he traveled around the world being the road runner in Holiday on Ice. And, um, and then, uh, he got injured while they were yeah, got extra money to move in to the help, you know, move the boxes of scenery in. And he was doing that and he dropped it on his foot. So um, after like six weeks in a hospital in London or something, they sent him home. And that was the end of his career with Holiday on Ice. And that's when he went to New Orleans and um, became an ice skating coach. And then he got, he, uh, he was like, he, had a, he was a great ice skating coach, but he was a little too um, not, you know, he was working with like very young kids and he loved them and everything. But, you know, it was... <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine why he might have ended up not having this job. And, um, so when I met him, he was a bartender in the French Quarter. Now, in the chronology of your writing, before Tony died, there was an es a biographical essay in the Chronicle about how you met. Is that true? Or am I just misremembering? Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I had I wrote for the Chronicle a, a carton of cigarettes in your purse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, actually, what you're talking about seems like a scene that's in First Comes Love, but you know, the memoir of me yeah, and Tony. Yeah. But um, I I was writing essays for the Chronicle. I mean, the, that's where this whole thing started was writing these essays for the Chronicle, and um, I started in '87, and um, the the very first one I wrote was called How to Get Pregnant in the Modern World. And it was about um, having very elaborate procedures of getting pregnant. But what I didn't say is the reason we were having all these elaborate procedures is because to I didn't, was trying to avoid becoming HIV positive. Right. right. Yeah, that, I left that out. So <laughs> and in my whole first book, Telling, um, which has many, many of the Chronicle essays in it, I don't tell. I don't say, because Tony wasn't really, you know, telling everyone, and this was then. But then um, your time, we didn't talk about it. Yeah, you didn't like walk around going, "I have AIDS," you know. But um, and especially if you were a hairdresser, 
but uh, yeah, so in First Comes Love, my, it was funny because telling, my first book was called Telling, and it was supposed to be so honest and everything out there, but actually there was some of it that wasn't out there until <laughs> First Comes Love. You know? No, but I still, I mean, I'll always, you know, the Austin Chronicle will always be the place that I started right, doing the kind of writing that um, I do now. So, yeah, that was great. And, and earlier, last month, uh, Jennifer was talking about an author talk with someone named Michael Corcoran. Yes. You, you may not know who Michael Corcoran is. I know, I know who he is. His I, name is Corky. I know, I know you know Corky Corcoran. <laughs> I don't recognize Michael Corcoran, <laughs> but I do remember. Never, um, I remember that uh, talking to him one time, and Michael Corcoran told me that his cure for writer's block was like, look, he would have this elaborate imagination of himself like winning the Pulitzer Prize, and that would make him feel like writing. I mean, <laughs> I've never heard anyone say that. It's the cure for writer's block. Well, before, before we get distracted too much, I, Please continue reading. Okay. Um, Queen of the scene. Sure. Speaking of the Austin Chronicle. There we go. And I also, um, because uh, we have a special request for the first cousins, I have to do that at some point. Um, okay. The Queen of the scene. So this is the one that I just read on um, live from here with Chris Thiel this weekend. Uh, which is a national NPR show that's the successor to Prairie Home Companion. And it was very, very exciting to get um, to do this. And I thought they might, you know, they picked which ones would be on the show, but I thought they might like this one because of the music connections and it's kind of a music show. So, and um, I mean, most people in Austin will probably know who this is. The queen of the scene died 2017. I met her at a strip club called The Dollhouse. She was one of the jam and jelly girls, bodacious backup singers in tutus who did burlesque routines with Dino Lee and his white trash review. The skater and I elbowed our way backstage to introduce ourselves. As she herself was a famous groupie, we figured she'd understand. About five years later, she became my editor at the Austin Chronicle, and the last time I remember seeing her was in 1996, after the skater died. And I wrote a book about it. She was in the studio audience at my stupid Oprah appearance. Her first husband was gay, as were her father and brother, so she fit into the theme for the show, which was, holy shit, I think this man is a homosexual. After sleeping with many rock stars, she began her writing career with a gossip column in the Austin Chronicle and quickly became its top music critic. By the time of her retirement at 60, she was beloved as the patron saint, den mother, historian, and MC of the whole scene. She went on to conduct what may have been the most glamorous, enviable, poignant, and lengthy death in history, which you could attend from afar on Facebook, with the city naming a park after her, and legions of musicians and writers offering tributes in the months before she died. She had several great loves, the last being a treasured Austin hash slinger named Steve. Though they had about five minutes before she got sick, it was a damn fine romance. You know what? Let me give her the mic. On a cold February day in early 2013, I told my boyfriend and my mother that something was wrong with me and I needed to go to the emergency room. I went into surgery the next morning and upon recovery, I was given a terminal diagnosis of stage four colon cancer. That quick, that fast. It's a cruel luxury to know death will come soon, but it's a bizarre comfort to know how. A life writing about music wasn't part of the plan. Then I'd had no plan. I've long joked that I got in through the back door, so whenever I'm let in through the front door, I run to the back, see who I can let in. <laughs> here, here. So who knows who that is? Does anyone know? <laughs> Type it in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's Margaret Moser, um, who was really such a great person. And I think her brother, 
Stephen Moser still may write for the Chronicle. Um, but yeah, we had so many funny connections. Yes, there's Go Sally. <laughs> Well, I was happy to actually quote her and let her, you know, when, uh, with um, writers that are, there aren't that many writers in the book, but I like to let them say something for themselves. <laughs> and I love the, I love the one about Susan Bright um, and where you use part of her prose poem about Barton Springs. Uh, how did you know Susan Bright? Uh, you know, save, save our springs. Um, yeah, right, right. <laughs> Uh, for a while, I was uh, unemployed while trying to figure out what to do after college, and I went to Barton Springs every single day. So, <laughs> yep. well, should, I guess we should, if we've invoked her, we need to read her. Okay, she's called the Warrior Poetess. Died 2010. When I moved to Texas in 1977, there was a rollicking poetry rodeo in full swing, featuring lyrical blowhards, Spanish-speaking divas, a taxi driver Kerouac, a deaf detective, grizzled drunkards, delicate Houstonians, and moving regally among them, a somewhat terrifying queen, a soft-voiced, full-bodied woman with a cheerleader's smile and straight blonde hair to her waist a feminist, a pacifist, an activist, a relentless crusader with a raised eyebrow that could hit every note from amused dubiety to all-out disgust. I, an 18-year-old enfant terrible wearing a bustier or an ice hockey uniform to read poems about my ill-advised liaisons, registered somewhere between the two. So we weren't close. And then I went away. And several decades later, I heard she had died. A brief struggle with cancer, said the obituary. Though 65 is too young, perhaps brief is not so bad. In the meantime, the press she started in 1975 had released 350 titles, and she herself 19 collections of verse, winning three Austin Book Awards, one Violet Crown Award, and the 1990 Prize for Texas Woman of the Year. She founded festivals and conferences and workshops and mentored countless young writers, but as was suggested in the resolution of the 82nd Texas legislature that honored her life, she was known as much for swimming as for any of these things. She swam every day, year round, in the icy emerald waters of Barton Springs, where a single lap is a full half mile, where the pool, the birds, the cliffs, and the trees surrounding them were threatened by development, then aggressively assailed from every side. And she served on the committee and spoke at the meeting and recited poems at the city council to denounce this. The men in black suits with their evil plans and pronouncements, their beards, diplomas with no courses in literature, or ethics, philosophy, or art. One, two, three, breathe. One, two, three, breathe. That's from her piece in the 1993 anthology, Barton Springs Eternal edited by Turk Pipkin, where we will always be together, her quietly furious, and me half-dressed, poetry heaven. There we go. <laughs> Marion also has a, a nice piece in that collection, Barton Springs Eternal, where she talks about uh, top <laughs> Yeah, it's just, uh, <laughs> three sonnets, three sonnets about Barton Springs. <laughs> That was fun. Um, yeah. So when I went to write about Susan, and I was so sure that I would be able to find a copy of that book in my house, but I couldn't. So thank God for, you know, the internet. I was able to order one, and now I have one again. So <laughs> I really didn't want to not have that one, for some reason, really made me want to read this other one. Um, I'll just explain who it is. Um, you, I had a long time when I was really good friends with Liz Lambert, the now the queen of Austin hotels and other things. Um, such a great person from West Texas. And oh, let me do a page. I want to read the one about her. Actually, she's in the book a lot. Um, her brothers are in it and her mom. But um, I'd like to read the one about her mom because it's also just so Texas. -y. So let's see where it is. 
called The Rancher. That one. I had no idea that was Lambert's mom. Yeah. And then the, the <laughs> ones about, um, let's see. Okay. I really have to find this. It's driving me crazy. Is it called The Rancher? Oh, here it is. Okay. Yeah. So it's actually, you know, it's her mom. And then the next one is her brothers. Yeah. Her Rancher. Died 2012. My Texas sized crush on the state of Texas, founded in Austin circa 1977, got its spacious Western annex in 1988. When a good friend took the skater and me and our six month old baby out to visit her mother in Odessa, a six hour drive that took four in her BMW. They were a family of cattle ranchers, her mother the sixth generation, and they still owned a nice sized piece of the Permian Basin, given a chunk away to build the university. My friend's childhood residence was a beautiful, relaxed family home, not overly formal as such a place might be up in Yankee land. There was a mezzanine that ran around the second floor and I could picture her three older brothers racing around it with their chaps and pop guns. We couldn't wait to strip off our infant son's diaper and put him in the hot tub, a plan my friend's mother, perfectly coiffed and dressed yet somehow slightly endearingly gawky, at first found alarming. But when she came out to check on us, she was tickled to death. Why, look at that, she said, blinking her big brown eyes. He's practically swimming. And every time that boy's, boy's name came up for the next 20 years, my friend's mother would proudly recall that he was the smartest baby she had ever seen. As much as I loved anything about the Lone Star State, I loved this family. Their stories, their accents, their cooking, their generosity, their incredible clothes and furnishings and art. For years, my greatest joy was to be invited to the birthday party my friend and her mother threw themselves every other year at the Gage Hotel out in the great nowhere bordering Big Bend National Park, where we would drink margaritas and eat Mexican food and dance under the stars for two days. I'm having such a hard time getting to the sad part. Maybe that's her doing. She buried two sons in two years to struggle so long with that damn disease taking everything you have left. Shh, y'all hush now, she says. Come over here and look at this sunset. Is that not the most beautiful sky you've ever seen? Love that. Yeah. <laughs> it's just great. So... Um, you, oh, oh, let me read the first cousin before I forget. Are you still here, Gretchen? Is she here? I hope so. What's that? I saw on Facebook today that, um, oh, one of my readers that had said that, um, her first cousin died last week. And it made her look up the piece in the Big Book of the Dead about my first cousins. And um, I thought I would read them. So sad. Two first cousins died 2008 and 2012. My cousin and I are together in the playpen. We wear thick white diapers and rubber pants that leave red circles on our chunky thighs. The game is pull yourself up on the nylon mesh walls and scoot around the edge of the pen. Already, as my cousin is a gentleman, he lets me go first. Our mommies are pregnant again, standing at the counter in their tented maternity blouses, a cigarette burning in the tray. They are stuffing celery sticks with a mixture of cream cheese, Roquefort, and Worcestershire, a recipe left by their own mother before she ran off and died young of a heart attack. Ten years later, the half-finished upstairs room on Dwight Drive, my little sister and I are making my cousin show us his penis. We did the same thing the other day to a boy down the street. Apparently, we are taking inventory. My cousin remains <laughs> gallant, if red in the face. If we really must see it, he will show us. His own little sister watches in awe, half admiring our terribleness, 
half bristling at her brother's subjugation. The big brother did everything right. Worked in his father's paint store, did pull-ups and push-ups every morning, brought bagels to his parents' house on weekends. His little sister did not follow his example. She meant no harm, and I don't believe she hurt a soul, but she never escaped the fallout of some early bad decisions involving a glass pipe. Hearts are a problem in our family. A few weeks after his 50th birthday, at his peak and prime, my cousin went into the bathroom one morning and did not come out. His sister con continued paying for her mistakes for another four years. Possessions disappeared, blood sugar spiked, toes were amputated. The night her little dog disappeared, it almost killed her. And then all the other stuff actually did. Since we have to live as if our choices matter, perhaps we should not dwell on the story of my two first cousins. <laughs> Unless you can think of something else it can possibly mean. Thank you. Thanks for asking for it. Perfect. Do you want to tell us about your cousin at all? Yeah, he, um, was just five months older than I, and he was uh, an actor, and he was uh, diagnosed at 24 with severe schizophrenia. Mm. And um, so he uh, finally burned out in LA and um, ended up going to Hawaii to live with his brother, where he lived for a long time until his brother just couldn't take care of any, him anymore. He wouldn't stay on his drugs. So he ended up on the street. Mm. And so two months ago, a car on the Maui highway hit him. <laughs> and for two months, we didn't know anything about it because he didn't have the ID on him. And we found out Wednesday and he passed away yesterday. Oh. So I was, as usual, going to my books, poetry and short stories and essays. And when I read you this morning, that's why I contacted you. Mm. I had read the book when it first came out, but I read it and I thought that was a, it was one of my favorite stories actually, vignettes. And um, I went right back to it this morning. Well, Thank you know, you. I mean, I think that the thing, like the part in the beginning when we're in our diapers in the playpen, yeah. you know, these super early memories that we have of um, cousins, you know, and um, I don't know, like people will say, well, how clear, how well do I really remember crawling around the playpen? I don't know, but I do have a few little shadowy uh, things in there that uh, I can remember the way the diaper pants were so tight. <laughs> I can remember a few things. And I definitely remember when we made the poor guy show us his weenie. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gretchen. It was really great that we connected today. You know, one I mean, of the things, go ahead. One of the things rereading the, the two books now now combined as one. Um, you know, a lot of the stories are are awful because human humans are messy and and especially my relationships with humans are very messy and and so some of these some of our stories are awful that's just the way it is and um, and i love capturing that awfulness in a way that's that makes it beautiful i mean these yeah. these essays take something that you know isn't a great story and yet makes it a beautiful beautiful that we can go back to over and over again um also i i hearing you read these reading them myself i'm always reminded of jim carroll's 1980 song uh, uh an yeah yeah and and that's also this you know a great anthem of yeah it's shitty that people die it's awful and there's nothing we can do about it but let's celebrate their lives. And, and that is what you have done in, this, in these short vignettes. And uh, um, I'm, I'm beholden, so. Uh, well, I think all of us, um, that's the one poet that I don't remember their name put it, you know, we all have a city inside us. 
of all these people that we've known, and many of them are not here anymore. And but there can be so there, you know, it's so everyone that you've ever known and cared about is so real to you, and is so much a part of your life. You know, whether it's Prince or Lou Reed or David Bowie, <laughs> though all three of them are in the book, or you know, your first cousin that you barely ever even saw since you were not, you know, 10 years old. I mean, everybody's, we all carry each other around. And I guess that was how it became, you know, the book. And it was fun when I realized that I could put famous people in it because I realized that the famous people that I care about so much, you know, were, that they were as much a part of my life as the people that I actually knew. So, um, yeah, so that's how these, those um, Keith Haring and the other super famous people, the people that, there, there's not that many famous people, but, you know, in the Glen Rock Book of the Dead, I decided not to do famous people, and I wrote that one called The VIP Lounge, um, and it has a ton of famous people all shoved into one, but then um, I decided, nope, no way I'm not going to write about Prince and David Bowie, so, you know. <laughs> So from the first cousins, that last paragraph is, since we have to live as if our choices matter, perhaps we should not dwell on the story of my two first cousins, unless you can think of something else it can possibly mean. And then from the skater that you read in the second paragraph, it says, it helped that he was a person who felt no need to make sense of things, that despite his cool affect, he was driven purely by emotion. And then in one you didn't read called The Graduate, you end it with, I don't know how the hell we go on knowing what we know. And so that gets me to a whole lot of grief is that we're sitting around trying to make sense of having to love these people that we may not have chosen to love. They just showed up in our lives and by regular interactions with them, because we're made to love, we end up loving them or seeing them or caring about them. and. And then they die or they move far away and we grieve them or they're around the corner and we don't pick up the phone or we let an old grudge make us grieve them. But I, I guess I'm, I'm one of the persons who likes to try and make sense of things, even though it doesn't make sense. And I was really jealous of the skater for being one of those people who didn't have to make sense of things. Like it's a big burden. Like, and I'm, wondering if it's like less burdensome to you this grief now that you've written it all down or if it's just kind of transformed into something that's beautiful because you loved and that the burden isn't a problem because like the grief is so much a part of loving you know we can't we wouldn't care if this wasn't a short time you know we wouldn't behave in ways that we wouldn't learn lessons. We wouldn't um, change our bad habits and our poor choices <laughs> if we didn't, if we, if it didn't affect the people that we loved. So that's a long lead up to a weird, a sideways question, which is so you've mentioned either in this book or an interview, kind of a return to Judaism, and the Minch is one of my favorite ones. So have you returned to Judaism? Hell no. I don't know it's where I would have cultural. possibly mentioned that. I'm a total atheist and I never have wavered from that. Um, no, I, I mean, I, I, I feel strongly that I'm culturally Jewish um, and I've never not, you know, I feel like Judaism is, a, being Jewish is a huge part of my identity in, a, in, the, in an ethnic sense. But I'm, yeah, but I'm, a really strong atheist and um actually um you write about that in above us only sky right after 9 11 i question you know when i saw that religion the kind of things that religion can make people do i just thought you know it's time to stop saying i'm an agnostic i'm actually just an atheist i don't believe in this so you know i i and but i as far as Judaism is it, being Jewish is important to me, but it's as a cultural identity, not as a spiritual thing at all. Do you think there's something about your the culture of 
being Jewish that has some things unique about remembering? Is that something that you picked up from your family and your community when you were growing up? I don't know. I mean, my parents were very <laughs> secular to say the least. Um, and so I, you know, they, we weren't a family that like yet lit yard site candles or said Kaddish or anything. I mean, I know about these things, but they weren't part of my life. Um, I mean, I think, I think there's ways that, um, Jewish attitudes are, uh, in me, but it almost comes more through literature than through religion. Like I've Philip Roth, Grace Paley, um, these there's writers that I love, and I feel like they have this worldview that maybe comes out of you know Yiddish literature and things that I I, I don't really can't really trace the whole thing back. But I, um, it's. It's, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, no, I don't think that I have really know anything about how, you know, except for, you know, what about sitting Shiva? Um, when, when, you know, when sitting Shiva is when you uh, close down your house and put the, I, I actually never saw any real sitting Shiva in my childhood because my parents were just not that kind of Jewish Jews. But um, when Tony died, I kind of sat Shiva in a way. I mean, I just, you know, we changed the whole house and sat there and just, you know, were sad and did nothing else for many days, which is, is a Jewish practice. But I, yeah, but I think I got it from reading a book or something, not from my, my family. You think you, uh, for me, one of my closest friends in my 20s was someone who was HIV positive and he found out he was positive when he was 20 and he lived till he was 34 which mm. at that time without medication was a long time and he was one of the wisest people I ever knew and his fantastic funeral which was a camping out in um, New Mexico people drove from all over the country to camp out together and they mm. down a dirt road in a thunderstorm and everyone kind of showed up anyway. Um, he was so wise because he lived with the waking thought of his death all the time. And he brought such real compassion to how he saw people into his memories that I feel like if we were more awake to the shortness of time, and less in denial of our own deaths that we would um, love bigger, you know? Well, I think those, you know, those of us who have had a lot of losses and that group is getting bigger by the second right now, right? You know, it, it, there's one of the silver linings is that going through really hard, tragic things makes you lot more available to other people when they are going through difficult things. You know, it's like a training in tragedy. So I've later, you know, I've had friends that have had such terrible losses and children. And, you know, I feel like because I went through such uh, extraordinary and, you know, big losses that I can, that I'm like one of the people that's not, that can be around the other people that are suffering and I don't, I'm not afraid of it. So I think that, um, we get like a training out of, um, going through our loss and awareness of death and that, that it, we can bring that to, to other people because I mean, it's so crazy, isn't it? Like right now, I don't really know that many people that are going through a ton of the worst of COVID, but the combination of the people dying and then not being able to be with the people and not being able to be with other people. It just seems unfathomable that people are having to go through this. <laughs> just really heartbreaking. I heard some, I mean, I've just like, I've heard of, I don't know if anyone here has a story or anything they want to tell us, but 
I've been really concerned for the people that are having to deal with loss and without being able to spend any time with their family. <laughs> or the body of their loved one. Mm -hmm. Or saying goodbye properly, like some of those deaths that I've experienced have been so incredibly important and meaningful. Um, we have a question um, in the chat, which was for you to talk to your about your mother a bit that she was such a thread throughout all your stories. Yes, yeah, such a thread and um, you know, she's the first one in the book, the alpha, and then she was alive when I was writing the Glen Rock Book of the Dead. She was had lung cancer and it was the end of her life. And I was, um, you know, she was helping me. I was asking her questions all the time and uh, researching the book, you know, sitting on her bed, asking her questions about all these people and um, seeing what more she would tell me about things I didn't know that much about. And, um, you know, my whole idea was, oh, my mom never going to be in this book. That's for sure. Like I thought somehow if I, I could hurry up and finish the book, then she wouldn't die. But, um, you know, she died shortly after Glen Rock, and then that's why she's the first one in, in the Baltimore Book of the Dead. Um, uh, I don't know. I, you know, I've, been, I've written a lot about my mother in so many different contexts. There's that, this piece that I wrote about welcome to the club that no one wants to be in, um, about losing your mom, that... Uh, I keep getting letters about this piece. I mean, I think that the losing of one's mom is, it's a, it's, an, it's a huge archetypal thing that we go through and it, it changes us in ways that are even hard to speak. But one thing we do is like, you know, you kind of become everything about your mom that you possibly can suck into you and keep with you, you know, you do. And, um, that's why, I, and I do feel like she's still here asking people, you know, if their boyfriend has a good job and, you know, things like that. Why don't they have any pants without holes in them, you know? <laughs> well, Jennifer, do we need to finish this up and reading the alpha a good way to finish? Could be, but let's see if people would like to unmute themselves and ask some questions first. If you're having any trouble unmuting yourself, chat in the group chat and I will see if I can do it for you. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh I want to say welcome home to Mary. It's, uh, it's just so great to hear your voice. I miss you on NPR. And all the, I mean, I, I just discovered this today, so I was like the last person to sign up. So I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I have toyed with doing a little anthology on Austin. One of the things that always stays in my mind was the piece that you, you uh, wrote and read. Um, right. You were leaving Austin. Mm. Uh, was it 2000? Uh, 1999. Millennial. Yeah. Okay, it was a, a millennium piece. We were talking about mm -hmm. it involved the millennium. It seemed to me just to, to be, it's my memories of millennium is I talk about raising two young Texans uh, in another place. Do you remember that piece? Uh, at all? Oh, we're frozen. You're remember so you. <laughs> okay. I'm, so, I'm, I'm sorry, it froze up, so I didn't hear anything for a second. Mm. Marion, Marion's frozen. Um, Ara, do you remember it? I do remember that piece, and uh, and that was a that was that was kind of a golden era of of in the chronicle for me because I could open it right. every week at that point. And there would be either a, a Marion Winnick essay or a quirky essay. And um, yeah, it was, I, I remember her uh, talking about uh, whether she's going to be able to take some Texas with her with these children. And, and yeah, 
Yeah. Not a native Texan. Just it made me feel like I was home to, to hear someone transplanted that's leaving. And gonna, just a, it's just a very special. Place. I hope I can find it someday and keep it. Thanks. Well, I would say, do we have any other questions for Marion? But her internet has frozen her out. Um, Aro, do you want to read a piece, or I can? Um, <laughs> well, I I wanted to finish with her reading the alpha, um, and if if she's unable to get back in here. I have it in front of me. I can read it. What do you think? I think you should read it because we never know and maybe she'll be able to reconnect, but maybe not. I'll email her the link just in case. All right. This is the Alpha Died 2008. Anyone who was at Camp Nawita in the late 1930s can tell you she was queen of the baseball diamond, the tennis court, the hockey field, the horseshoe pitch, and the lake. Too bad she beat Title IX by 40 years. It wasn't exactly the heyday of female business majors either, nor women in the workplace. And for a really bad idea, try sending a young woman on a business trip by herself, wedding ring or no. Enough already, she got pregnant, moved to the shore, took up golf and gym. She won her first club membership in 1966, just as I began my poetry career. I raced into the dining room where she was drinking her martini Ode in hand. She had a bad lie in the weeds of 16 ere she lofted and landed her ball on the green. Everyone's mother is mythological, her body the origin of existence and consciousness, her house the pimped out crib of Zeus, her mistakes the cause of everything. Holy her rose bushes, bushes. holy her blackjack system, her London broil, holy. My mother, the godhead of seven Dwight Drive, rose daily from her bed to quaff her Tropicana orange juice and slay the New York Times crossword puzzle. She survived a difficult childhood, my father's hijinks, two heart attacks, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, surgery for divert, uh, I can never say this word, diverticulosis, and the many poor decisions and inappropriate outfits of her daughters. <laughs> she certainly did not believe a clot in her lung would bring her down, that smoking for 65 years would actually cause lung cancer, or that lung cancer was definitely fatal. The last thing she did before she took to her bed was win a golf tournament. Clearly, the subprime crisis, the market crash, Hurricane Sandy, and even Donald Trump were bid biding their time until she was out of the way. Marion, you're back. I'll let you finish. No, you finished. This is great. <laughs> and then she was. Imagine Persephone coming up from hell and Demeter, Demi Demi I can't pronounce that word. How do you say it? Demeter. Demeter, Demeter. there. Strange cars in the driveway, rosebush skeletons. You stand there at first, uncomprehending your poem in your hand. Then you go somewhere, call it home, call it spring. Oh, thank you for reading that. We, we um, lost you, and so I wanted to get that in before we ended. <laughs> um, I actually was thinking that of something that I would read something else for the end. Um, if everybody want, <laughs> has another second, is it okay? No. <laughs> uh, so, um, I have recently written this um, kind of poem that's called a Sestina about quarantine. And um, just to explain, a sestina is a, a poem that you, you have six words, and these words appear at the end of um, every line in a different order. So in this poem, you're going to hear like these words over and over, found, rules, outside, masks, boys, and home. And so in each stanza, they'll be in a different order that is prescribed, and then at the end, they're both twice. And um, so here we go. Things to do in quarantine. My daughter suggested killing Eve with its lovely assassin, Villanelle, and I found myself thinking of poetic forms, gazals and terzarimas. With its repetition and rules, Sestina is the art of quarantine. This daughter, 
who never exercised outside of gym class, is now running for miles, doing yoga and Pilates, applying masks and serums, preparing for a beautiful future with clothes and boys. What's new, pussycat? More Zoom, more YouTube, more books and home cooking. Handmade wontons stand strong against tedium and despair. Stay home, stay safe, wash your hands, take off your pants. Turn on the TV and pledge newfound allegiance to State Farm and McDonald's. Be together apart. Stir fry the new normal. Celebrate heroes with free Taco Tuesday. First responders rule. My daughter and I walk to the public gardens full of tulips and couples in masks. As any dog can tell you, it's so good to be outside. Get this. I was scheduled for knee surgery this summer. Now there's an outside chance I'll be replacing my own patellas and femurs right here at home. I'm in med school at the University of Google. I have my surgical mask all ready. Until then, it is Saturday, unless it's Sunday or Thursday. Like Apple, I've found that two-factor verification is best, the pill sorter and the garbage truck. Rule, <laughs> the rule ran away with the exception. Nowadays, people are burying old hatchets, says the New York Times. Sadly, others are digging up those hatchets or making hatchets anew. Sleeping dogs plus crowded quarters equals quarantine apocalypse. Outside, the night sky with Mercury in Aries. A Scorpio moon gets stuck in transit. Ruled by Venus, sensual Taurus folds her sorrows into a meringue and celebrates at home. 62, yowza! I've ordered felled tip pens and a one egg fry pan. Lost and found, the cat, a sense of self, the original cast album of hair. Underneath this mask, I am smiling at you, old friend. I wish you could see it. Still no masks in my dreams, but last night I did receive a Zoom invitation. Sailing to the new world in my 1950s boat, I hit the Gulf Stream of consciousness and I foundered. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. My cousins had to stand outside the window of assisted living to get a last glimpse of their father. They went home without telling Aunt Joan, who is in memory care. Despite the new rules, four instead of three were permitted at the burial and the bending of this rule appeared unto them as a blessing. They stood in their yarmulkes and their N95 masks around the grave of their father and each told a story, their elegant childhood home, his box seat at the Meadowlands. At 97, imagine finding a new way to die. I know my mother would be interested in discussing this. Outside on a sunny golf course in another dimension, perhaps she can be found. Here at home, we have just a few rules. Whatever you found is yours to keep. Don't jump. Unmask. My daughter will take your new headshot. Meet us outside. Yeah, very nice. Thanks. Uh, Mary, I just want to say that I, I read that uh, uh, the first time about two hours ago. Uh. And I've already, I've already forwarded it to five of my very best friends in the world. <laughs> Well, uh, I, I loved to, to, that I got to hear you read it uh, right here. Thank you. This is a, gift, a great gift. Thank you. Oh, I'm so glad you found out about it. So let's see. What did this? Um, I have a new fan, and I have. You can uh, reach culture of. Yes. Oh, thank you, Sally. Thank you. Thank you, everybody that came to this. I think this has been the only Zoom event that I actually have liked. In the whole. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.